Well, welcome back to Family Bible Time. We're in Deuteronomy chapter 7. We're the smaller family. What happened to our family? Oh, yes, yeah, she's away on camp. But we're in Deuteronomy 7 and we're in Psalm 90. Teach me to number my days. Oh, this is just joy. So let's pray. We're going to get stuck into God's Word. Father in heaven, thank you for blessing us, giving us time around your word. Thank you for teaching us, leading us, helping us. Please bless this study. Lord, please bless it for, for your sake. We pray that you bless us, teach us as we read and think. Bless your people as they yeah, join in with this study from their homes, Lord. Would you be with our daughter in the camp? And we pray that you would watch over us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, Deuteronomy 7. This is amazing stuff. So, um, Deuteronomy 7. Hmm. This is going to challenge our thinking. We were talking about this this morning uh, early and, and just thinking through some of the implications for the differences between the God's covenant relationship with the Jews as his people Israel and then God's relationship with us in as we are in Christ as Christians as we're Jew and Gentile in one body the church but everyone who's in the church is is in Christ and receives the blessings um, of God's promises to to Christ and his um, his uh, you could say offspring the ch the children who are added into his family, we as a Christians adopted into his family. This chapter is just phenomenal for thinking about that. And as we get stuck into it now, um, I'm sure you're going to want to revisit this. I'm sure you're going to want to mark up this chapter heavily, as maybe you can see mine is marked up. Um, let's just get stuck into it. We have prayed. Let's go. When the Lord your God brings you into the land, you are entering to take possession of it and clears away many nations before you. Here they come, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the, and the Jebusites. Seven nations, more numerous and mightier than yourselves. I think there ought to be a comma after that word, seven nations, because this is chapter seven, it talks about the seven nations, but were each of the nations more numerous and mightier than Israel? Or were the seven nations combined more numerous and mightier than Israel? I think the latter, personally, but um, someone maybe can comment if they think differently. Um, seven nations, more numerous and mightier than yourselves. And when the Lord your God gives them over to you and you defeat them, then you must devote them to complete destruction. This is God's judicial act using the people of Israel as his instrument of judgment upon these nations you shall make no covenant with them you shall and you shall show no mercy to them you shall not intermarry with them giving your daughters to their sons or taking their daughters for your sons for here's the reason they would turn away your sons from following me to serve other gods then the anger of the Lord would be kindled against you and he would quickly, he would destroy you quickly. But thus shall you deal with them. You shall break down their altars and dash in pieces their pillars and chop down their asherim and burn their carved images with fire. Well, that's pretty intense. Yes, it is pretty intense. It's called God's wrath. Now, little side note as we get to this point, just so that you don't forget the reason, the, whenever you see the word for, like look at verse four, it begins with the word for, but it's not number four, it's, it's since, you could say. Don't, don't do this. Don't, don't intermarry, God says to his people, because, or well, since, they would turn away your sons from following me to serve other gods. You say, well, hang on a minute, wouldn't the Jews intermarrying with the other people 
Wouldn't they turn away them from following their gods? Wouldn't they kind of naturally have a a, a positive influence on the peoples around them? To if they intermarried with them, surely they would they would actually um, kind of have that influence on them. Well, actually, the answer to that question and the answer to the question is it okay for a believer to marry an unbeliever? The answer to the question is no. It's very simple. Mm -hmm. And why? Because God knows this is the tendency. We don't actually need any extra help to turn away from the living God, do we? We, we? we have within our hearts all that we need by way of a rebellious spirit. All we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, you know. That's the way of us as Christians. We are just wayward. Now, God comes along and he says, don't make it harder on yourself. Mm. Because if you do intermarry with these people, they're going to lead you astray. That's how it's going to be. So please um, don't think that you know better than God. Just take it from God and let's have believers only marrying believers. Very simple. Anyway, verse 6. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. Why am I making that transfer from Old Testament Israel to New Testament church? Well, because this is true of us, isn't it? The reason, so, so don't intermingle with them. Why? Because you are a people holy to the Lord your God. Well, so are we as Christians. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession. And that's true of us. Wow, praise God. Out of all the peoples are on the face of the earth. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love upon you and chose you. For you were the fewest of all, the, all peoples. But it is because... Now, stop, 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 stop. We're just about to get the reason why God chose Israel. It is because the Lord loves you. Hang on a minute. So he loved them because he loved them. Yep, you got it. <laughs> it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping, here's the second reason, and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers. So God loved you and called you out of Egypt and chose you to be his own because he loved you, people of Israel, and because he's keeping the oath he swore to your fathers. Yeah, but he chose them too. Jacob have I loved, Esau have I... So God just picked Jacob. And his descendants. And he said, wow, this is just like as if God just chose to love certain people. Exactly. It's called election. It's written in the Bible. Read Ephesians 1. Um, you can't get away from it. Predestination, election is biblical. You just have to accept what the Bible says about these things. Now, anyway, here we, here we get the closest to a reason. God loved you because he loved you. <laughs> And because he kept his, he's keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers. Um, that And comma, that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand. So that's the reason the Lord has brought you out of Egypt with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Verse 9. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Well, there you go. That's all you need to know, isn't it? Mm -hmm. To overcome generational curses. And repays to their face those who hate him by destroying them. He will not be slack with the one who hates him. He will repay him to his face. You shall therefore be careful to do the commandment and the statutes and the rules that I command you today. And because you listen to these rules and keep and do them, the Lord your God will keep with you the covenant and the steadfast love that he swore to your fathers. He will love you, bless you and multiply you he will also bless the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your ground and the grain and your grain and your wine and your oil and the increase of your herds and the young of your flock in the land that he swore to your fathers to give to you. You shall be blessed above all peoples. There shall be not be male or female barren among you. 
or among your livestock, and the Lord will take away from you all sickness, and none of the evil diseases of Egypt, which you knew, will he inflict on you, but he will lay them on all who hate you. And you shall consume all the peoples that the Lord your God will give over to you. Your eye shall not pity them, neither shall you serve their gods, for that would be a snare to you. Now, just to pause there. This is very interesting. I was saying to Donna this morning, it would make a very interesting PhD subject. Not that I'm planning it. Um, and I did say I wouldn't do it, right? So not, not on this subject, at least. Very interesting research subject to compare the covenant blessings upon Israel under the old covenant with the blessings that are promised to Christians in the church under we're under the new we're kind of included in the new covenant so we're under the law of Christ now here it's really helpful perhaps maybe helpful to you to realize that the blessings and the curses were made to Israel so if they loved God and obeyed him and kept his commandments then they would be blessed within that covenant and God would bless them and these are the blessings you read about them in Leviticus 26 you're going to read them in Deuteronomy 28 um these, there's just this whole list of blessings. Blessed shall you be in the field, blessed in the basket, blessed in your, uh, blessed in your bearing children, blessed everywhere. It means you're blessed when you go out, blessed when you come in. It's just blessed, blessing, 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 blessing. Upon God's people who God covenants to bless, but when they are obedient to him. Now, if they're disobedient to him, the disobedience brings discipline. And under the discipline, it included for the people of Israel being kicked out of the land of Israel, ultimately, and being slaughtered and being, you know, destroyed. And But before that, in stages, it comes, you know, you, you're going to be cursed. You're going to be cursed in your basket. You're not going to have enough bread. You're not going to have enough, um, you're going to have enough food in general. You're going to be cursed when you go out to war. You're going to be cursed when you come back. You're, just everything's curse, 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 curse. But it was all connected with the land, the promises to them of blessing in the land, blessing in terms of fruitfulness, in terms of no miscarriages, in terms of um, just lots of food and, and safety and peace and so on. But then curses also connected with that. Now, one of the discussions that we've had many times is, well, look, if you... If you come to these Old Testament curses, like, for instance, this one about miscarrying um, and not being able to bear children, and you happen to be barren, you happen to be unable to carry children, and you come to this and you read this and you can just go, oh, is this, am I just cursed? Well, hold on a minute. This was to Israel. So a really interesting area of study would be to compare, okay, we are the people of God in the New Testament. We are chosen by God and we're made into, we're even made as Jew and Gentile to be a, a people. It's almost like a nation, but it's not replacing Israel. It's not a nation. We don't have land. We don't have that kind of, that kind of covenantal promise. But we do have, Many, many promises of blessing. And we also have laws, the law of Christ, all the commandments that Christ has given us. It would be very interesting to see in the New Testament what the promises are for us and how that works out. I think it's just really helpful here to back up and to say there's this huge difference between the Old Testament and the people of God, and the New Testament, and the people of God, because all their blessings were connected with the land, and their fruitfulness in the land, and ours are not. So let's just say that. We don't get to be, you know, if we're obedient as Christians, Jesus promises us persecution. And you're like, huh, 
that's the opposite of what was promised to the people of Israel. So if they were if they were obedient, they would have peace. And Jesus said to his followers, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you. And he said, rejoice when they persecute you. So you know, we've got to understand that things are very, very different. And so, listen, if that comforts you, or if you can comfort someone with this, if they're struggling with childlessness, it's not necessarily because they've sinned and they've broken the covenant and they're missing out on these covenant blessings. I mean, right here, we talked about none of the evil diseases of Egypt. You're going to, going to take away from you all sickness. God was promising them health, wealth, and prosperity. Mm-hmm. God does not promise that to us today. Haley in your bed, Tim Sherrick. Right now. So God does not promise that to Christians today. So what does God promise to Christians? That would be a very very helpful um, study, wouldn't it? I think the other thing to say here by way of comparison is, well, they had... They had God's covenant with their fathers. So they had, you know, God, why is God blessing you and bringing you out of Egypt? Well, because he's, because he loved you. It's like, yeah, sovereign election. Yeah. And he's faithful to his promise to your fathers. So, oh yes, the covenant with Abraham and the covenant with Isaac and Jacob. Jacob is picked out. He's going to be your descendants. They're going to inherit the land. And you say, yeah, so God is fulfilling his covenant to, to their fathers. And, and because of that, they were being blessed. And you go, wow. So they got blessed because of God's promise to their, their fathers. Well, hang on a minute. We, we could make some comparison with us in the church. And I was saying this morning, mm-hmm. for us, being in Christ... God has made promises to Christ and his offspring, as it were. The believers, those who believe in his name, whoever believes, we're included. So we get blessings because God has loved us and just chosen us. And you're like, what did I do to deserve that? Nothing. Was it because I was better than the other people? No. So, but we get those blessings, and then because God is being faithful to his promises to Jesus, <laughs> that's pretty cool, isn't it? So we get to be blessed in Christ because of God's, the Father's love for God the Son. Mm. And that's really quite the place of blessing, isn't it? Wouldn't you like to be part of that? I would. I am glad that I am. Mm. Now, let's pick it up in verse 17. If you say in your heart, these nations are greater than I, how can I dispossess them? You shall not be afraid of them, but you shall remember what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and to all Egypt, the great trials that your eyes saw, the signs, the wonders, the the mighty hand and the outstretched arm by which the Lord your God brought you out. So will the Lord your God do to all the peoples of whom you are afraid. Moreover, The Lord your God will send hornets among them until those who are left and hide themselves from you are destroyed. And you shall not be be in dread of them, for the Lord your God is in your midst, a great and awesome God. The Lord your God will clear away these nations before you little by little. You may not make an end of them all at once, lest wild beasts grow too numerous for you. But the Lord your God will give them over to you and throw them into great confusion until they are destroyed. And he will give their kings into your hand and you shall make their name perish from under heaven. Did you ever meet a Hittite or a Jebusite or a Hivite? I don't think I've ever met one. Anyway. No one shall be able to stand against you until you have destroyed them. The carved images of their gods you shall burn with fire. They were to be iconoclasts. You shall not covet the silver or the gold that is on them, or take it for yourselves, 
lest you be ensnared by it, for it is an abomination to the Lord your God. And you shall not bring an abominable thing into your house and become devoted to destruction like it. You shall utterly detest and abhor it, for it is devoted to destruction. There you go. That was Deuteronomy chapter 7. Wow, so much there. Psalm 90. Oh, so much here. Mm. Thankfully, we're doing well on time. Okay. A prayer of Moses. This is book four in the Psalms. We're making our way through them, aren't we? A prayer of Moses, the man of God. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. By the way, if you walk past a Mormon in the street, you know the Mormons are the ones with the white shirts and the badges that say elder so and so. If you walk past a Mormon, they teach that in the Book of Mormon that there was a time when God was not. Mm. Uh, it's like bizarre teaching that about how God was a man and he became a God. Um, so if I walk past a Mormon, I just tap them on the shoulder or uh, catch their eye and say, Psalm 90 verse 2, look it up. Or if they come to my door and I'm too busy to talk to them, I'll just say, Psalm 90 verse 2, sorry, I can't talk, close the door. Because this, is, this has the ability to totally unravel Mormon theology if they understand what they're talking about. It'll, <laughs> it'll put a spoke in... Um, it'll put a, a spanner in their works, let's put it like that. All right, verse 3. You return man to dust and say, Return, O children of man. For a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it's past, or as a watch in the night. Now, um, there's a this verse is quoted in the New Testament. It says a thousand years are as one day and a, and a day is a thousand years with the Lord. Sometimes people take that and try to make a scheme out of it as if when it says a day, it means a thousand years. Read the whole verse, please. For a thousand years in your sight are as are but as yesterday when it is past or as a watch in the night. <laughs> and there are lots of watches in the night. So... It just totally unravels that, that scheme if you just read the whole of this verse instead of the first part in the New Testament version. Um, okay. You sweep them away as with a flood. They are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed. In the evening it fades and withers. For we are brought to an end by your anger, and by your wrath we are dismayed. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. You can't hide from God. For all our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our, our years to an end like a sigh. The years of our life are seventy or even by reason of strength, eighty, yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone, and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? So teach us to number our days, that we may get a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? Have pity on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, and for as many years as we have seen evil. Let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to their children. 
Let the favour of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Okay, wow. This is the background to this psalm. So it says it's the psalm of Moses. The background to the psalm is probably Numbers 20. Miriam has died. Um, Aaron has died. We've just been through this, haven't we? The people of Israel have been wandering through the desert now for 40 years. Mm. And the whole generation has died. Mm. Remember me saying this a few couple of weeks ago? Funerals every single day multiple funerals every single day for the last 40 years wandering through the wilderness can you can you picture this with a middle eastern funeral going on and an extended camp there's there's no there's no sound insulation in a camp is there somewhere in the camp there was always wailing going on remember when they left egypt and they heard the people of the the Egyptians wailing for their dead, and it was remarkable. I think the wanderings in the wilderness would have always been to the to the sound every day of a funeral somewhere, and the reminder of the curse mm. upon the nation of Israel because of their disobedience. And for forty years they've been wandering and dying, and wandering and dying, and wandering and dying. And now Miriam's dead, and, and Aaron's dead, and Moses is about to die. And what does Moses say? This is a prayer of Moses. It's interesting, isn't it? They've been wandering in the wilderness. They haven't had a steady place to live. And he starts off by saying, Lord, you have been our dwelling place. You've been the place where we live. That's helpful, isn't it? You, you may not have such a steady place in this world, but if you have God, you can have what Moses had here, a dwelling place. Even if you're a, a, a nomad in this life, and in the New Testament, we, we are called pilgrims, aren't we? We, we? we pick up the words of that spiritual this world is not our home. We're just a passing through. And here Moses picks up that thought and says, but you have been our dwelling place. How lovely. And yet God is killing us. There's no, there's no other way to put it. Verse 3, you return man to dust and say, return, O children. This is God condemning us all to death you say we live in god but god is condemning us to death yes that's the way of the faithful we we face the reality verse 10 that the years of our life 70 or by reason of strength 80 but even so it's toil and trouble we're soon gone the days are soon gone and we fly away What's the conclusion? Verse 12, teach us to number our days. That doesn't mean teach us to work out how many we've got. It means teach us to consider how few they are and value them. Not one life, let's live it, but one life, let's make sure we live it for God. So, um, how are you doing? Are you, are you numbering your days? Have you thought that today or tomorrow could be your end? We, we were walking the dog earlier today. Karis is off at camp. We were walking the dog. We came around the corner and a car, you know, we were walking alongside a, a, a wall. car came around the corner so fast. Just idiot young driver trying to treat the village like a racetrack and came around the corner so fast he skidded and nearly lost control all the way around the corner and nearly crashed into a couple of cars and then zoomed off kind of weaving in and out of them as if he's um, trying to qu 
qualify for a Grand Prix or something. Mm -hmm. But but it could have been so different, couldn't it? I said to Donna at the time, we could have just been in glory. You know, that could have been, not very nice for Karis, but we could have just, it could have been that. He could have lost control, crushed us against the wall. That was the end of our lives. We'd be home with the Lord. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. um, our days are short and uncertain, aren't they? You, you, you think you're taking your dog for a walk and that could be your last moment. And we, obviously in the providence of God, that wasn't for us. And it wasn't for him. But it could be, couldn't it? It could be tomorrow. Nothing guarantees another day. So are you numbering your days? Do you want to use these days for God? Are you, are you saved? I mean, if the last day for you would be today, are you saved yet? Don't leave it another day. Before you know that you have peace with God, we... We had an old man on our walk today, didn't we? And we, you know, we, we, we were going to walk the dog and, and we bumped into this old man and, you know, he got we got talking to him and suddenly you're into the position where you're saying to someone, um, well, do you think about life after death? And, you know, he's not been very well. So he, you could pray for this old man that we met on our walk, that we would be able to follow up and really bring the gospel to him. He was... Mm, almost open to it wasn't he <laughs> um, but he was at least listening and thinking about his end and that's what Moses is saying come on consider your end you're gonna die um, are you ready to die are you ready to meet God mm. Lord I pray that all of us would consider the reality of our coming end the reality of death we wouldn't brush it under the carpet, that we wouldn't drown it out with all the noise in this world. Oh Lord, help us. Help us to be bold with those around us. Help us to be transparent with people and to love them enough to tell them the truth. But Lord, help us to number our days, that we might have a heart of wisdom. Lord, we pray that you would work in us that you would save each and every one of us and that you'd help us to live for you, for your glory. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. We're done for today. Oh, I get to turn the camera off. So we'll say goodbye and I'll let Donna wave to you.